I think probably the one for me personally would be one when I was a player and it didn't really involve me. It was in 1975 when uh, uh, Richard Appleby ran an end around on two or three different occasions and then the last time he stopped threw the football to Gene Washington and uh, we completed an 80 yard, I believe it was, touchdown pass to upset Florida at that time, uh, 10 to seven. Appleby, stand around, just stopped, planted his feet and threw it. And Washington caught it, thinking of Montreal and the Olympics and ran out of his shoes right down the middle, 80 yards. The girders are bending now. Look at the score. Needs a block. Hurst in trouble going to the sideline. One man missed him. Another the chief missed. responsibility of any radio play by play man is to describe the action that unfolds on the field. But Georgia fans get an added bonus. Their play by play man describes the drama that unfolds as well. 45 40. Hurst has got a man trying to get him to the side. 30, 25, 20, 15, 10. Touchdown. Larry Munson was not born a Bulldog, but it's hard to tell. In 1966, Munson was hired to be the eyes of Bulldog fans all across the South. But he became much more than that. He became Georgia's biggest fan and biggest warrior. I think I used to drive Dooley nuts because I, I worried a lot. And I, and I could talk to Dooley on the night before a game, and he, he started avoiding me because I would, you know, seriously at the time, I would tell him, you know, God, we ain't big enough. You know, we just, we ain't big enough. And somebody would sprain an ankle. I remember once our rover back Krug in an Auburn game trying to clinch a championship over at Auburn and we lose him on the bus going to the field. He goes down on the bus and we haven't got the rover. I, I never forget that and of course I found out about that. I was really moaning and groaning about stuff but that wasn't put on. I was very much concerned because I really wanted to win. Mobile bobble the snap, comes back, and he throws a long pass. Larry Munson has a unique ability to absorb the emotion of the game that's being played before him, and he's able to put that emotion into his call of the game. The gravelly-voiced legend in the Georgia press box never put on a Georgia jersey. He never played a down between the hedges. But when the dogs go to war on Saturday afternoons, he is battling in the trenches with them. He lives and dies with every down. And in the process, he has endeared himself to Bulldog fans everywhere. While his unique style was apparent from the beginning, it took seven years and a big upset in Knoxville for the Munson Bulldog bond to be cemented. Yeah, I wasn't totally perhaps wrapped into it, and I think where it opened up, uh, for me at least, was one day in Knoxville when suddenly Tennessee uh, made a mistake and we got the ball and we drive down and we score real late and I'm living in Nashville at the time and commuting in the late 60s when this happened and I hollered without thinking at the end of the game, my God, I said Georgia has just beaten Tennessee in Knoxville, you know, and I blurted that out and then of course I got in my car and drove home to Nashville. Well, that started pushing things over the edge a little bit. 31 to 28, Tennessee leading Minute 44, minute 43, minute 42, one flanker, power eye, they're on the 12, everybody chanting defense, George are going to line up on the 26, George has got a first down on the Tennessee 26, the stadium rocking, stadium can't believe it. Well, those are the times that, that you come out here and you work on these practice fields for, that's, that's what you live for, is to make the big plays at the big time, uh, something you can talk about. 23, 24 years later, you know, people still talk about it and everybody remembers it a little bit different. It was just uh, a feeling that everybody just said, okay, we've got 
uh, 60, 65 yards to go. Let's line up, let's do it, and let's get it over with. Yeah, it's very confident. And we'd had such a good year that, and then coming from behind right there at the end, just, that was a, good, it was a great feeling. On October 3rd, 1973, 70,000 people crowded into Nayland Stadium to watch Georgia and Tennessee light up the scoreboard. The dogs got on the board first. Jimmy Poulos goes around the left side for a nine-yard score and a seven-to-nothing lead. But the Vols quarterback, Conridge Holloway, was able to guide his team down the field as well. He scored one touchdown and threw for another in the first half. The dogs, Horace King, found Pater twice in the half as well. Georgia took a 21-14 lead into the locker room at the half. More fireworks in the second. Eddie Brown fielded a Georgia punt at his own 15-yard line. He ran right and then cut up field, finding a path to the end zone. The run electrified the home crowd and put Tennessee in the lead 24-21. Haskell Stanback appeared to ice the game for the Big Orange with this short run that gave them a commanding 31-21 fourth quarter lead. But the 1973 Georgia team had enough grit and determination to fight back. Andy Johnson connects with Poulos on a short touchdown pass that cut Tennessee's lead to three. The Bulldog defense would hold. And on fourth and two, Tennessee tries to fake the punt. Big mistake. Georgia takes over on downs. Georgia is eight and a half yards away. Minute 17, minute 16, minute 15, second down on the eight and a half. Andy going to take it, give it to Harrison. Fake it, Andy Johnson. Touchdown, Andy Johnson. Touchdown, Andy Johnson. What a fake. They hit Harrison dead on the nine, and Andy bootlegged to the left and scored. My God, Georgia beat Tennessee in Knoxville. Georgia's defeated Tennessee 35 to 31 in Neyland Stadium. The engineer and I were both fully dressed, and we just took our billfolds out of our pockets and just went on the diving board and just went right in the pool. And we didn't get back to Motel till 1230. We just dove in the pool with all our clothes on after beating Tennessee that night because we were really a whip ball club. 1130 to play. Electric scoreboard flashing the words defense. Tennessee trying to hang on to a six-point lead. Slot with an eye. Tennessee crashing off one side. We pitch it to Herschel. Going to get him out. 10, 8, 7, 5. Herschel. Herschel Walker. Well, I had one thing sticking in my mind before he ever played his first play. Dooley had said to me very quietly, what I may have on my hands here is nothing but a big, stiff fullback. And that's the way he put it. And in scrimmages, the guys had uh, taken care of him pretty good. And he was third string tailback the night we went into Knoxville. Once we put on pads, it, he was a different player. Uh, and when he got in the game in Tennessee in the opener in 1980, uh, we saw a guy we didn't see during the preseason. I mean, he was running over people. We knew we had a competitor. And we knew he was a talented guy. He had the whole package. And it, it really it just excited the whole team because the year before, we knew we were close to winning an SEC championship. We were lacking one player, and that player in our system had to be a dominating player at running back. And we got that player in Herschel Walker, and in that Tennessee game, we knew it was going to be a big year for us. And then the kick is good, long, going to come down inside the 30, and we hit him. He fumbled the ball, and the dog missed it. It's rolling to 10, to 7, to 5. We fumble it again. We fumble it. It's in the end zone. Get on that ball. Hopes are always highest at the start of a season. Everyone is undefeated, and each team has championship hopes. But in September of 1980, Georgia fans were concerned with rebounding from the 6-5 and five season of 1979. It was a sweltering night in Knoxville, Tennessee, when the Dogs opened their season on September 6th of 1980. And things got hotter on the field when the Vols jumped out to a 15-0 lead on their home turf. But then momentum swung toward the Georgia sideline. This fumble would elude everyone's grasp, and the ensuing safety got the Dogs on the board. Trailing 15-2 and desperate to establish a rushing attack, Vince Dooley called on freshman Herschel Walker. He may have been young, but it was obvious he was a man among boys. While Herschel did his thing on the field, Munson was running with him in spirit. This has not been a night for old lady luck. Georgia knocking on the door. They're on the Tennessee 16. Tennessee has dominated this one. They gave us a break. We couldn't use it. Then we gave them a couple. 
15 to 2 Tennessee leading crowd roaring against Georgia trying to make them drop it so they can't hear we hand it off to Herschel there's a hole 5 10 12 he's running over people oh you Herschel Walker my god almighty he ran right through two men Herschel ran right over two men they had him dead away inside the nine Herschel Walker went 16 yards. He drove right over Orange Church, just driving and running with those big fives. My God, a freshman. 15-8. You think this isn't big right here? Do you realize what has happened in this thing tonight? Tennessee in a 7-4, and Rex sticks it up, and it's in there. Good. 11:30 to play. Electric scoreboard flashing the words, defense. Tennessee trying to hang on to a six-point lead. Slot with an eye. Tennessee crashing off one side. We pitch it to Herschel. Going to get him out. 10, 8, 7, 5. Herschel. Herschel Walker. Tennessee gets the other side. We went to the short side and pitched it to that kid out of Johnson County. He got a block in front of him out around the 6 or 7 and got inside of it and went in the corner standing. Give the guy some rest. It's 15 to 15. My God, what's going to happen in the next 11 minutes and 16 seconds? Robinson to try the extra point. Tennessee, seven men on the line. One man's going to jump in the middle, and Rex sticks it up, and the kick is good for the first time tonight. Georgia 16, Tennessee 15. 422 to go. Georgia leading 16 to 15. Tennessee trying to save himself here. Balls come up to the line. Oshevsky behind it. We're in a six five. They put a man in motion. They pitch it to the tail. He fumbles. It rolls around. Everybody dives. I think Georgia's got the ball on the two-yard line. We cracked it out of his hands. Georgia's caught the ball. About the two, it squirted up in the air, and somebody dove on it in the secondary. They pitched to the tail with a man in motion and ran a sweep with a couple of blockers. He cut inside. He penetrated four yards. Eddie Weaver and Joe Crimmins hit him. Georgia's got the ball on a one and a half. Oh, God, look at the clock. 4-0-2, and it's on a one and a half. Georgia up to the line. Power eye. Tennessee up in there, seven men on the line, and Buck curls over the ball, and somebody tried to blitz between Morrison and all. And look at the clock. Oh, look at the clock. They have come back, and they beat Tennessee 16 to 15. for many years after the incident in Knoxville, the uh, Tennessee coaches uh, would play my broadcast of the Herschel's first touchdown run where he ran over Bates and split a couple tacklers at the same time. They would play that over and over on speakers to their football team to try and get him up and get him ready. Do you think as a result of this game you have gotten a lot of attention? Uh, do you think people might expect too much out of you? Well, I really can't say, but I hope they don't because um, we get out there and at least at every game and get a, give it 110%, and I hope they expect what I can give, and that's about all I can give. In 1980, a freshman sensation by the name of Herschel Walker stormed onto the college football scene, and Larry Munson was there for every toss sweep and every handoff. The red and black freight train led Georgia to the 1980 National Championship. Walker's great plays on the field were always complemented by Munson's great calls in the booth. There have been many great combinations in Bulldog history. Baloo to Scott, Zyre to Hunter, but the combination of Munson and Walker may be the best ever. And up, Herschel Walker, five, ten, twelve, he ran over him, he ran over him. There he goes, Herschel's gone, Herschel's gone. And they run a trap with Herschel Walker, got a hole, five. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. There goes Herschel. There goes Herschel. Suddenly, 76 yards. Herschel Walker scores. Hole at the right tackle. Man, did he turn it on when he had to. Suddenly. With Herschel, as you took your voice and you went step by step with him on the air, or five yards by five yards with him, you yourself were working yourself into a frenzy because you felt at any moment he was gone and he was going to go 80 or whatever. I think your voice came up 
and your energy level came up, any time he got a little hole and you saw him come through and realize how big and strong he was, he might go. And I would imagine you were putting more of yourself into the game whenever Herschel had the ball. A whole ball game coming down to this. Rex Robinson out of Marietta, Georgia. 16 to 14, Kentucky with eight seconds. The stadium standing. Well, some of them are upside down, but they're trying to stand. It's gonna be held just inside the 19. You know, a lot of people can never get out of their mind the Rex Robinson kick in 78 that beat Kentucky. And that's because we had to drive so far the last two and a half minutes and then kick it to win it as the game is ending. Hyburn takes to McClendon, comes back to the left and looks and looks, and he throws it long down there, and Scott got up in the air, touchdown! The 1978 Georgia Bulldogs were a special team. The so-called experts had picked them anywhere from the middle of the pack on down in the powerful SEC. The players preferred to settle such issues on the field and prove they had enough heart and desire to make up for any shortcomings. In October of 1978 at Lexington, Kentucky, it looked like it wasn't the dog's day. The Wildcats had controlled the game and had a 16 to nothing lead midway through the third quarter. But then the offense struck quickly. Willie McClendon got hot and Kentucky was in big trouble. Later in the drive, McClendon would score to make it 16 to seven Kentucky. After trading punts, Jeff Pyburn went by air for the next score, hitting Ulysses Norris and the Cats lead was down to two, 16 to 14. Georgia would regain possession with four minutes left in the game. They drove to the 12 yard line before calling on Rex Robinson. 247, 246, the dogs desperately, desperately trying to save themselves up in Lexington. Tyburn going to go to McClendon at left tackle, 5, 10, 12 yards, McClendon up to the 42. The cross just will not stop. Tyburn throwing to Scott, complete over the left side of the 35. The clock's against him. Georges come flying back down to the Kentucky 16. One man split wide, 25, 24. Tyburn, McClendon driving in the middle and they knocked him down in the 12. 11, 10, they're all about the 11 and now eight seconds. The dogs call time. Now, guess what's coming up? Just inside the 19. It's set down. He puts it up. It looks good. Watch it. Watch it. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've come down to the Georgia 38 with 48 seconds to go. It's 20 to 13. Vanderbilt comes up to the line. The dogs desperately trying to stay unbeaten. And I mean desperately trying to stay unbeaten. They're on the Georgia 38 with 48 seconds. I think defensive football players are, are, are just a little bit different breed than the offensive football player. You, you're always reacting, you're always making up, you're always the underdog. Uh, I particularly like that situation where you, where you, have, to, you have to make up for uh, lost ground and, and uh, people don't really expect you to be able to do it. It's, uh, you're always scrapping and you're always fighting. And it, it's not so much a talented position as it is just a guts and hard work and determination position. And I think that that is more conducive to feeling at the end of the game that you really earn uh, the respect of the other people. And uh, I enjoy that. Uh, Hogue. <laughs> Could talk all day about Hogue. I didn't know until about the end of his senior year all these little special drills he had to get quickness into his feet more to help his jumping ability. He worked at that. Little things like you'd like to teach your kid to do, but you know, kids aren't going to take time to do that. But Hogue did that. Hogue was just remarkable and proved it in the NFL because he was not fast enough, but he still played well. He, Hogue was just, just absolutely outstanding. I don't say he's the best defensive back we ever had, but he always showed up in the right place, if you remember. And as a freshman, we lined him up to block punts when we first saw him, so there was some kind of a quickness there. And he was a genius up here. Our Georgia team passed a true stress test in Nashville against a fired up Vandy team. The test went all the way down to the last play before the final outcome was Georgia 20, Vanderbilt 13. 
The play of the defense was superb against one of the most prolific passing teams in America. We only gave up 13 points, and it was more outstanding when you consider that 10 of those 13 points came as a direct result of our offensive mistakes. There were some outstanding individual play, like, like Andre Holmes, who intercepted two passes. But perhaps Terry Hogue was the difference in the football game. Georgia was 4-0-1 when it paid a visit to Nashville in 1983. The Commodores had been a pesky opponent for the Dogs through the years, and this was no exception. The Dogs got two first-half touchdowns from tailback Keith Montgomery. This 30-yard scamper gave Georgia a 14-10 lead. Vandy was putting the ball in the air most of the evening, but Terry Hogue was there to make life miserable for the Doors. Just before the half, he stops a Vandy drive with this diving interception, but it was just part of an evening of great plays. Normally a rover back, Hogue was playing out of position at safety. He was also playing with some pain and a noticeable limp. All that went away when the ball was snapped, however. In the second half, Vanderbilt connected on one field goal, while Kevin Butler hit two for the Dogs. Georgia led 20 to 13. Vandy had a chance, but they just couldn't find a way to get around Hogue. He deflects one ball here. But Hogue would save one of the biggest plays of his college career for the closing seconds of the game. They've come down to the Georgia 38 with 48 seconds to go. It's 20 to 13. Vanderbilt comes up to the line, the dogs desperately trying to stay unbeaten, and I mean desperately trying to stay unbeaten. They're on the Georgia 38 with 48 seconds. Page, kind of a long count this time. He's back now to throw, dumps it to a running back on the 31. They hit him right away, but it was complete. They got seven yards, and the clock is running 37, 36, 35 seconds. Page dropping back with 16 seconds less than that. He's going to run to the right. He's throwing a long bomb in a corner, and there he is. And somebody broke it up with a great leap. Terry Hogue got up in the air. Hogue got up with one hand and broke up a cinch touchdown down there. I told Terry Hogue, as well as the football team after the game, that not only is he the finest defensive player that I've ever had the privilege of being associated with, but in my opinion, the finest defensive player that I've ever seen. Terry Hogue, even in his senior year, was still doing certain drills to increase his jumping ability and the quickness of his feet, because Hogue was slow. The Dogs won 20 to 13 on their way to a 10-1-1 1983 season. That's right, the flags flew because everybody from the Georgia bench charged out there, including, I think, some civilians. Butler kicked it 60 yards plus a foot and a half. It's 26 to 23, and America held its breath. Butler was an outstanding kicker from a long line of kickers. Strong leg and proved it when he got to the Bears. And accurate. Won an awful lot of games in the NFL, just like he won a lot of games for us. Butler was an outstanding, outstanding kicker. There is nothing quite like the thrill of a last second victory. Thanks to Kevin Butler, Georgia fans were thrilled in 1984. The number two ranked Clemson Tigers came to Sanford Stadium and threatened to run away with it. They struck quickly in the first half while Georgia could manage but two field goals. Clemson took a 20 to six lead into the locker room. But the dogs would come back in the second half thanks to Tiger turnovers. Todd Williams connects with Herman Archie from 19 yards to cut Clemson's lead to seven. Two series later, Cleveland Gary tied things with his one-yard score. Then it was up to the kickers. Butler from 43 yards to give Georgia a 23-20 lead. Clemson's Donald Igwebuike tied it at 23 from 48 yards away. With time waning, the Georgia offense tried desperately to get Butler back into field goal range. Tron Jackson went 24 yards on a draw play, but it would still take a tremendous boot to get the job done. Butler was up to the task. The 
stadium rocks and swings, and the dogs are on Clemson's 45, and it's 23 to 23, 64, 63, 62 seconds. Georgia up to the line on the 45. Trying to make something happen, second and nine. Look at the clock saying no, no, no. 33, 32 seconds, 23, 23. We have used up our last time out. Very big third down here, and we cannot, you know, there's just no time. But do you realize we're in this thing? Todd running around to the right and looking. He goes for the sideline, and he threw it too high and out of bounds. Incomplete. Clock stop with 17 seconds. So we'll try to kick one 100,000 miles. We're holding it on our own 49 and a half. Going to try to kick it 60 yards, plus a foot and a half. And Butler kicked a long one, a long one. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! The stadium is worse than bonkers. 11 seconds. I can't believe what he did. This is ungodly. Butler's fourth field goal of the day gave Georgia the 26-23 upset win and gave fans one of the most exciting finishes ever to a game played between the hedges. Interesting thing, though, on Buck, he almost left school right after he got there. Uh, the White Sox came to him, and they wanted to sign him for baseball. And they offered him a contract and $25,000. And they were going to send him to Appleton, Wisconsin. And he and his dad took a map out and put it on a kitchen table to find where Appleton was, wondering if Buck should do this thing, just walk away from college go to professional baseball and make some money. They found Appleton not too far from Chicago, technically, and decided if they could get 50,000 out of it, they would do it. But the $25,000 figure stayed there. They couldn't get the 50. So he went on and had a great career at Georgia. Growing up as a youngster in Valdosta, I knew Georgia had two very special games that everybody paid attention to, Florida and Georgia Tech. As a youngster, my father was a big Georgia fan. I dreamed about one day perhaps playing in one of these games. And people ask me, Buck, what was your biggest thrill at Georgia? And some of them are disappointed to hear that it wasn't the Notre Dame game in the Sugar Bowl in 1980. It wasn't uh, the Georgia-Florida game in 1980 when Lindsey caught the pass and went the distance. And to me, the most special game for me was that Georgia Tech game in 1978. I think every player really likes to look back at that first game they had an opportunity to play in. And for me, it was the Georgia Tech game in 1978. I hadn't played in four or five weeks and had no reason to believe that I would play that week. But we fell uh, down 20 to nothing. Coach Dooley looked at me and said, Buck, get in there. I had to find my helmet. I didn't even know where that was. I really didn't have time to be nervous. All I knew was we were down, and this was a great opportunity because we were going to have to throw the football, which is something normally we wouldn't do. So I was very excited about that opportunity. Just one of those days for me where everything I did was the right thing. It's really hard to explain. It just happened that way. I mean, underneath it all, I was confident that I could do the job. But until you get out there and actually do it, the people around you have a little doubt. Now, I think I proved to a lot of people on our team that, uh, you know, I was capable of helping the team win, and that meant more to me than anything. I think it's probably the greatest spectator game that we've ever been involved in because you had everything in the game that you could possibly have. You had an onside kick. You had a kickoff return. You had a punt return for a touchdown, Scott Warner, followed by a kickoff return by Georgia Tech for 105 yards. And then uh, we were backed up, had to go to go for it on fourth and 10. Buck Ballou, a young freshman, comes off the bench uh, to lead us. And uh, he gets trapped back there and somehow gets the ball off to Amp Arnold, who scores. Now we got to go for two. The first time we go for two, we don't make it. But there are eight flags out there at least because they've interfered with us. So we get another shot. Uh, our fullback runs the wrong way on the play. Uh, but despite that, uh, we make a tremendous play. Buck pitches out, and Amp Arnold scores and prances in the end zone. We're up now by one, but Tech isn't finished. So they come down the field, and they got Eddie Lee Ivory. I mean, what a sensational day he had. 
And finally, we intercepted the ball inside the 15, 20-yard line uh, and finally won the game. But I think of all the great spectator games, I'm not saying this is a game I like as a coach, but if you were just going out to watch a football game, to me, that's the greatest probably we've ever had because it had so many things all in one game. One fake blue looking, finds a man on the sideline. He hits Scott, and Scott's feet went out. He slipped in the wet grass on the 29, just as two men, however, were waiting there for Time out on the field on the score, Georgia 14, Georgia Tech 20. Now what's going to happen? The 1978 Georgia-Georgia Tech game was arguably the best game in the history of this storied rivalry. The emotional roller coaster that happened on the field could only be matched by the emotional roller coaster that was Larry Munson in the press box. The Jackets dominated the first half at Sanford Stadium in front of 60,000 fans. Eddie Lee Ivory scored twice, and the Jackets added two field goals to take a commanding 20 to nothing lead. But in the second quarter, Vince Dooley replaced starting quarterback Jeff Pyburn with freshman Buck Ballou. The move worked. Georgia scored just before the half, but still trailed 20 to 7. In the second half, Willie McClendon punched it in again, and Tech's lead was cut to 20 to 14. That's when the fireworks started. The Dogs' defense forced a punt, and Scott Warner took it from there. Trying to set up a return, and Ted Peebles kicks it very well. Warner on the 28, ran by one, ran by another, ran by another. 50, 45, 40, 35, 30. at the stadium. Look at it. 20 to 20. Scott Warner, 72 yards. Just boom, straight up. But the lead was short-lived. While the red and black faithful were rocking, Tex Drew Hill took the ensuing kickoff and raced 101 yards. After a successful two-point conversion, the Jackets were back in front, 28 to 21. Now, there is no sense in going away because you know it's not going to end like this. And it didn't. Buck Ballou would engineer an incredible 85-yard drive that would include two fourth-down conversions. It was the type of challenge that the 18-year-old freshman quarterback thrived on. I never doubted I could get it done. I mean, if anybody ever believed in Buck Ballou, it was me. Uh, as a freshman, there were some doubts. But uh, you know, I knew if you concentrate on those doubts, you're not going to get the job done. And, and my background had taught me that I had been successful in those pressure situations, and I, I never doubted it at that point in time. I knew that a lot of people were depending on Buck Ballou to get it done. And even as an 18-year-old kid, uh, I didn't focus on that. I knew uh, I had a job to do, and I was confident in the fact that I could get it done. I was anxious to prove it to the teammates that, that I was capable of helping them win, and that was very important to me. The dogs had their backs to the wall, but this was nothing new for the 1978 Wonder Dogs. This team would do their best work in the last three minutes of the game. Fourth down. What a year. 236 Georgia getting beat in their own ballpark. They need two and a half yards now on fourth down. Buck Ballou sprinting to the right, looking to throw, looking in trouble. And there's a man open. Arnold! Touchdown! Touchdown! They're going for two, and young Buck Ballou looking, and he throws, no, interference. They knocked the receiver down, three flags. Officials threw the flags immediately, so they moved the ball half a yard closer to the goal line. Different play came in from the sideline at that point in time. Uh, the quarterback uh, option, we were going to fake to the tailback, Willie McClendon up the middle, and I was to get out on the corner. Uh, Play the defensive end. If he took me, I was going to kick it out. He took me. I barely got it out to Amp. And once I saw him catch the ball, I knew there was nobody out there to, to uh, prevent him from scoring. Immediately, uh, I knew he was going to score and we were going to win the game. Uh, how do you describe it? I mean, as a freshman, you never expect these things to happen. I, I just pure out just joy. I, you know, I didn't know how to react as a freshman. Gosh. Look at Tech and a 6-5, pack close. Dogs need a yard for possible victory. And Ballou picks the ball. Arnold got it. Anthony Arnold, a flag. He got two points. Anthony Arnold, a flanker. They ran Anthony Arnold. They pitched a delay and got the yard. 
29 to 28. Buck probably was vastly underrated, never given a chance to stand in the pocket, let's say, and throw it 17 consecutive downs, like all quarterbacks dream of. Great talent, great baseball player, and probably could have had a career in Major League Baseball if he had walked away from college football the first time the opportunity came to him from the Chicago White Sox. Now, Buck was uh, really, really underrated, very accurate, strong arm. And you know, there was two or three games where we suddenly just let him throw a bomb early in a ball game and he, he would connect. But he played with a running football team and he was part of it. He was very much a part of it. Florida and a stand-up fire. They may or may not blitz. They won't. Buck back third down on the eight. In trouble. Got a block behind him. Gonna throw and a run. Complete to the 25. To the 30. Lindsey's got 35, 40. Lindsey's got 45, 50. 45, 40. Run, Lindsey. 25, 20, 50, 10, 5. Lindsey's got. Lindsey's got. Lindsey's got. Just before the play happened in 1980, I had given up totally. Because uh, we were down inside our own tent, as you know. I am, however, the first person to see what everybody finally saw much later on. I saw the block behind him that saved Buck when he came out to his right to throw the ball. Because even in the play-by-play -play of it, uh, as I mentioned, Buck comes out on the seven or eight yard line. Real quickly, you hear me say, he gets a block behind him. Because I saw number 65, Nat Hudson, the guard, come across and a guy was about to sack him from behind his body. And Hudson only got part of his right shoulder and just kind of nudged that guy. It was not a big flying block. He nudged him out of the way, and that block made the play go. For any team to go undefeated in a college football season, they must get a few breaks and perhaps pull off a miracle. In November of 1980, the Georgia Bulldogs needed some fourth quarter magic against Florida to keep a national championship season intact. Early on, the dogs made it look effortless. Freshman sensation Herschel Walker sprinted 72 yards. He would rush for an amazing 238 yards on 37 carries against the Gator defense. But Florida freshman quarterback Wayne Peace was impressive and poised. He passed for 282 yards. And when he led Florida on a drive that resulted in this 40-yard field goal, Florida had a 21-20 lead. After an exchange of punts, things looked hopeless for Georgia. With a scoreboard clock behind them and the length of the field in front of them, the Dogs pulled off the single most significant play in Georgia football history. Without it, there is no national championship. Buck Ballou and Lindsey Scott hook up on a 93-yard touchdown pass, and Larry Munson was along for the ride. Blood and a stand-up fire. They may or may not blitz. They won't. Buck back third down on the eight. In trouble. Got a block behind him. Gonna throw and a run, complete to the 25, to the 30, Lindsey's got 35, 40, Lindsey's got 45, 50, 45, 40, run, Lindsey, 25, 20, 50, 10, 5, Lindsey's got, Lindsey's got, Lindsey's got. Well, I can't believe it, 92 yards and Lindsey really got in a foot race, I broke my chair, I came right through a chair. A metal steel chair with about a five-inch cushion. I broke it. The booth came apart. The stadium, well, the stadium fell down. Now they do have to renovate this thing. They'll have to rebuild it now. <laughs> I, this, is, this is incredible. I didn't mean to beg Lindsay to run, but I had to. 26 to 21 with a passing attack that wasn't working all day. And Lindsay caught it. I think the 25 or 30 or so, no timeouts left in the game. You know, this game has always been called the world's greatest cocktail party. Do you know what is going to happen here tonight? And up at St. Simon's and Jekyll Island and all those places where all those dog people have got these condominiums for four days. Man, is there going to be some property destroyed tonight? 26 to 21. Dogs on top. We were gone. I gave up. You did too. We were out of it and gone. Miracle. We were one of the only undefeated teams in the country at that time. And, and uh, you know, it was slipping away from us. But it's strange in the huddle, 
That day, I wanted the football. I wanted the football. I wanted to make something happen that day. I, you know, and that, that, that day, I remember going to huddle, just, just, just to give it to me. I, I can make something happen. I knew I had the ability to go all the way, but whether I was going to do that or not, I, I really didn't know at the time. I really didn't know if I was going to go all the way, but what I was trying to do was get up field as much as I can, you know, and I'm thinking all the time I need to get this ball as, as, as far up field as I can, you know. And, and then I realized, hey, I do got some running room. And then once I got to the outside, you know, I realized that, hey, I can outrun these guys to the end zone, you know. And, uh, you know, from that point on, it was a foot race. But then again, we didn't give up. We did not give up. And uh, <clears throat> we were able to come back and win the ball game. Everybody around me had jumped up and was jumping and hollering and then ran out in the hall so they could really uh, let out some hollers. I was trying to jump, but I, my chair was too far under the table, and the table was across my thighs, and I, I couldn't get all the way up my chair, so I was kind of rocking up and down, and what I didn't know is the chair was apparently already weak, even though it was steel, and all of a sudden that chair just, just did a thing like that. This was all going on during the crowd roar while they were all down in that end zone celebrating. My chair was just flat going down like this. Our broadcast booth had just emptied of people. When I saw Lindsey cross that goal line, I knew we, we had gotten the job done. And just to feel that ground shake, because it was shaking, it was like an earthquake. Uh, and the, to hear those Georgia fans cheering like, like they had never cheered before, I, just emotionally, I, I just collapsed there on the 50-yard line. And the next thing I knew, several of the players had uh, jumped on top of me. Lindsey's one play, I mean, you know, he'll never live that play down. And thank gosh it was so successful and it won the whole world for us. But that play will stay with him all the rest of his life. It doesn't matter where he goes, high or low, that play stays with Lindsey Scott. I guess the play stays with me too and it stays with Buck. But it also ought to stay with that lineman who threw that little block behind Buck down on the seven yard line, Nat Hudson. 43 seconds. Alabama on their own 44. Where does he throw a three left and one right? He's back to throw. He's throwing long to the left. Carswell intercepted on the 33. Carswell fell down in the 40. Carswell intercepted. Carswell saved our Franny. I probably leave part of myself in the stadium. Again, I think I pull harder now than I used to. I've had people tell me, oh, you've changed. You don't, you don't pull for them like you used to. Man, they don't even know what they're saying. They have absolutely no idea what they're saying. Some of them got upset because I was in the NFL for four or five years. They didn't want me to root that hard for the Falcons. I've had people tell me that right to my face. But I've been rooting harder here because a win here means more, see. I pull harder now. And I have probably have more emotions for it now. Heads. You call heads. And it is heads and Alabama wins the call. Even though they are border states, Georgia and Alabama play each other infrequently. But when they do put on the pads, it is usually a thriller. Never settled until the closing seconds. And such was the case on September 22, 1990, in Sanford Stadium. The crowd had already worked itself into a frenzy by kickoff time. Among the 77,000 fans was a young boy who would one day demolish the Georgia record book. Our cameras caught 17-year-old Eric Zier on his first official visit. He would be very impressed with what he saw that afternoon. So impressed that two days later, Zaire decided he would wear the red and black the next year. The Crimson Tide was still looking for its first win under new head coach Gene Stallings, and they looked poised to get it, leading 16 to six entering the fourth quarter. But then the Bulldogs went to work. Quarterback Preston Jones replaced Greg Talley and immediately provided an offensive spark. He guided the dogs on a 71-yard scoring drive. Larry Ware went the final three yards for the score. Now trailing 16 to 12, Georgia would elect to go for two. Ware headed around the left side, but then threw the ball to tight end Chris Broom, and Bama's lead was down to two. The rejuvenated dog defense rode the wave of momentum and stopped Alabama on its next possession. It looked like Georgia would not get in field goal range. But on third and 12, Garrison Hurst picked up 17 of his 106 yards down the right sideline. The enthusiasm on the Georgia sideline was plain to see. It was evident in the radio booth as well. Three plays, and seven yards later, John Casey took center stage. Well, guess what? Ball 
was on the 23. Fourth down. 109 seconds now, less than that. Field goal. Going to be held on the 30. Casey to try. Bohannon. The kick. left shoe now look at the clock it's 17 to 16 and Alabama's got three timeouts dogs lead for the first time we've been behind for 17 hours now we got a one-point lead but Alabama's got three timeouts everything now is extremely large Georgia suddenly has climbed on top the team on the bench asked the crowd to get in it again. Here's Alabama trying to save themselves. 59 seconds to go. They're on their own 49 shotgun. Hollingsworth going to take it. Hollingsworth throws out of bounds. Incomplete. The man was diving at it on our 39. Incomplete. Alabama up to the line. Is this the last time of the day for them? 43 seconds. Alabama on their own 44. Where does he throw a three left and one right? He's back to throw. He's throwing long to the left. Carswell intercepted on the 33. Carswell fell down in the 40. Carswell intercepted. Carswell saved our Franny. And the dogs will have the ball on the 40. The team is mobbing Carswell. On the greatest moment and the greatest play of Chuck Carswell's collegiate career, he did something he had never done before. He gathered his defensive unit around him. He knelt and he prayed. Amen. 13 to 13, the Sugar Bowl, the championship swinging, and I mean swinging on a little thread here. Every single play means something now or you're gone. Total war in Auburn, total, just completely total war. My cigars may be part of Georgia football history too. We sure used to do superstitious things with cigars. We found out many, many years ago if you had a lead going in the fourth quarter and you lit one, you'd win the game. A Couple times we forgot because the engineer was supposed to light one with me. A couple times we had to make a change in it and we would light it only in the last five minutes of a game if we had the lead. And then it would work. We always won, but we had to light the cigar. Those are stupid, dumb things, but that's what you do. The heart of a champion is obvious in the fourth quarter. That was never more evident than November of 1982 when the Georgia Bulldogs were going for their third consecutive SEC title. But to get it, they would have to win at Auburn. Early in the contest, Herschel Walker did his thing, rumbling 47 yards through the Tiger defense for a touchdown. Georgia led 13-7 at the half. In the second half, it looked as though Auburn might break the hearts of the Bulldog faithful. Lionel James broke free for an 87-yard score in the fourth quarter that gave the Tigers the lead and the momentum. Now trailing 14-13, the Georgia offense carved out a long drive. Herschel capped his 177-yard day with this three-yard score. Lashing her to Herschel. That's a tackle. Touchdown. Touchdown, Herschel. A two-point conversion failed, and the Dogs were now protecting a 19-14 lead. The offense had proven it could get the job done when up against the wall. Now the defense would have to prove it as well. The Tigers drove down the field, but Georgia was not just protecting the end zone. It was defending a championship and a Sugar Bowl berth. The call is vintage Larry Munson as he lives and dies on every play. 19 to 14, they pitch it to Bo Jackson. They block, he comes out stumbling to the 50. One man got him on the Georgia 42 or three. Flag down, little Sanchez got him. Now watch the penalty because we've killed ourselves with penalties in the third quarter and it may be on Georgia. You don't win championships doing that and you know it. Auburn, you know now what they got in the back of their mind. If they get some help out of Starkville, they can tie up at this thing if they can beat us. Georgia leading 19 to 14. 
needing a play of some kind, a break of some kind. Hunker down, you guys. Dogs are in a six. Actually, only four standing. They're in a six-four, and they pitch it to Bo Jackson. One man knocked him off balance, and Flack came up and got him. Ball back on the 21, and it's second down now, and 17 with 2.05 to go. Auburn trying to break our hearts here. 19 to 14 in a dog's lead. Again, you guys, hunker down. Auburn up to the line. Big Edwards to the right, the little train to the right. One man split left, a man a slot to the right. Randy Campbell with a man blitzing. Carver got him from behind, back on the 30. Carver blitzed from the right-hand corner. Carver blew in unprotected. They had three wideouts on the right. Oh, man, two big plays, 84 seconds. Third down, 21, Auburn back on the 30. Watch this now. I hate to keep saying it, but hunker down. You didn't hear me, you guys, hunker down. Dogs in a five. 5-3, kind of a 5-4, one wide out to the left, a man in motion, little train going to the right. And Randy Campbell, they blitz him, he dumps it over the middle, and it's complete on the 25 to Ed West. West stumbles and falls on the 20. Ed West reached, made a good one-arm grab off balance on the 25 and fell down on the 20 as the dogs are coming across on the 21. Pass play was nine yards, it's fourth down. Timeout, Auburn. Timeout, 49 seconds. Fourth and 17. I know I'm asking a lot, you guys, but hunker it down one more time. Auburn up to the line on the 21. Man split left, two men wide right, and a man on the slot to the right. Dogs are in a four, and Campbell, as they blitz on him, he threw a high, wobbly pass. They fight in the end zone, and the dogs broke it up. They broke it up. They broke it up. Ronnie Harrison, Jeff Sanchez got up in the air. We had pressure up the middle. They pressured the quarterback, one man in the middle, and one from the flank. They pressured him, and they made him throw it. The dog with 42 seconds. I won't ask you to do that again, you guys. Ball on the 21. They pressured him. Did you see him? I kind of arched that ball. Somebody blew right up the middle at him, and I think that was Hogue trying to come from the right. The ball almost on the 21. 32 seconds, Lassinger up to the line, Auburn massing six with three, and Lassinger falls back on the 16 and takes a two-yard loss as they curl over the ball. Georgia students and fans standing and roaring, 23, 22, 21, clock running, running. Oh, look at the sugar falling out of the sky. Look at the sugar falling out of the sky. Here comes a Georgia fan running out across the field in his red pants and breaks over toward the dog bench. And now everybody's drawing three, two, one, and they're carrying Vince Dooley off the field. Dogs have won it. Somebody threw something on us. Dogs have won it. 19 to 14. The defense hunkered, didn't they? They did hunker. McIntyre down here on one knee looking up at the booth all by himself. Everybody else mopped in the middle. We saved ourselves. We saved ourselves. There won't be many of us in Opelika tonight, but I'll tell you one thing. We're going to do something to Opelika. Dogs to winner 19 to 14. Bill Schaefer will try and wrap this thing up in 60 seconds. Local message right here. Georgia Bulldog Network. I've heard the final moments of the Auburn uh, broadcast myself, I think, played over and over in many places. Uh, in fact, if people listen to it closely, they'll hear me say, somebody threw something at me. I mean, it, it's right there in the middle of whatever I'm saying as I was talking about, uh, I think I said the sugar's falling from the sky because that meant we're going to Sugar Bowl, of course. And without saying something as corny as we're going to the Sugar Bowl, I just said whatever I said and they were carrying Dooley, I think, off the field. And then that's when this guy had a, had a big orange coat on and blue shirt, blue pants, big cowboy hat. He was a big man, about 280. He, was, he could hear me hollering. Our booth was open. He was in a private box next to us. And he just had this bourbon and Coke and a big glass, and he just leaned his arm around and just threw it right in my face. Now, he had to, it had to go about eight feet, but it got my spotter, Dick Payne, a little bit, and it got me and it got our broadcast boards pretty good. Well, the other spotter, Lewis Phillips, he just jumped up to fight and ran out the door and trapped him outside. 
and <laughs> try to attack the guy. So there was a little bit of stuff going on out there, but I wasn't aware of that. All I knew is I had bourbon and coke on me. Here they are in that old-fashioned T again. Three backs. They only need eight, nine inches. And White tries to keep it and sneak late. He didn't do it there. He tried to keep it. They ran the fullback. White tried to step in. Watch the clock. Nine, eight, seven, six. Play hard. Play hard. I don't care what goes on in the game. You play hard. The 100th anniversary game between Georgia and Auburn in 1992 was just like the 99 previous meetings. It was a war. Georgia got on the scoreboard first as Garrison Hurst went in from one yard out. 7-0 Bulldogs. Hurst would carry the ball 31 times for 105 yards. The Tigers would have trouble moving the ball against the stingy Bulldog defense. The Tigers managed just 119 rushing yards. James Bostick does manage to get into the end zone late in the first half, 7-7 at intermission. In the third quarter, Eric Zier would go upstairs to Hurst, who scampers 64 yards for Georgia's second touchdown, 14-7 dogs. But a fourth quarter Auburn field goal made it 14-10, and suddenly the Tiger defense kept Georgia from moving the ball. The Tigers drove toward the end zone, fighting both the relentless Georgia defense and the stadium clock. They would lose to both. Now Auburn Stadium roars as their offense runs out on the field. Stan White waving at the crowd to make a lot of noise. And he says something to an official. And he bumps one of his tight ends. Here they are in that old-fashioned T again. Three backs. They only need eight, nine inches. And White tries to keep it and sneak late. He didn't do it there. He tried to keep it. They ran the fullback. White tried to step in. Watch the clock. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. We're out lined up three. They have no timeouts. Two, one. I think it's over. They can't get a playoff. We saved ourselves. I don't know how. They couldn't get a playoff. White tried to fake it. They ran to the full, and then he tried to sneak in. Auburn wound up. Auburn messed up with the clock. Auburn couldn't get a playoff. The dog stopped White trying to sneak in. We saved ourselves. No, we didn't. Old Lady Luck saved us. Old Lady Luck has defeated them. The defense won the ball game. Make no mistake about that. 14 to 10. The defense has saved our whatchamacallit. He's an institution. Yeah, I mean, he really is. Uh, you know, I, a lot of people say, boy, it's tough to follow a legend. You know, when I followed Coach Dooley, I said, yeah, it's tough. You know, who wants to follow a guy that's had all that success? You know, you, you don't have a chance. And I, I'd a lot rather have followed Coach Dooley than I would be the guy that's going to follow Larry Munson. Not that my job's easy, and I don't mean that at all. Mine's tough enough. But uh, to follow Larry Munson would be one of the most difficult things anyone will ever be able to do. My legacy at Georgia, I hope would be, is something I heard said about me once on Georgia television. They said I was like the 12th man on the team. Now, that's not a brand new statement. It's not been invented here. It's been said by other schools and teams around the country. But I liked the sound of it the first time I heard it, that I might be Georgia's 12th man. I've pulled my insights out trying to win. Being a part of the fans and part of the people, that's the way I'd like to be remembered. And Georgia's got seven men on the line. Got three men back this time. Hatcher has a man rushing. They blocked the kick. It's bouncing around in the air. And Georgia's got it. Touchdown! Touchdown! And they pitch it to Tron Jackson. He's wide open. 45-40, 35-30, 25-20. Touchdown! Touchdown! Zyre rolls right, stops, and he throws a long one down the middle, and it is touchdown! <laughs> and it's set down, and Butler kicks it. Look at it! Look at it! Look at it! Yeah! Yeah! Timeout, 49 seconds. 30 seconds, local break, Bulldog Network. <laughs>